I'm just checking on the page, refreshing it. I think we're there. Are we there? Great. Well, it says that we're live. I can see that we are. Great. Cool. Well, welcome Facebook land. Welcome to our second in our series of the Restored First Man Standing Campaign Foundation Series, where Gaz Thompson, myself, will be interviewing uh, different guests each week to discuss their experiences of male violence towards women and what we can do as First Men Standing to stand up and speak out against it when we see it. So the intention of this is to gather some information to talk about our shared experiences and really kind of build a firm foundation for us to build upon as we take this campaign forward. And my guest today is a guy named John Sutherland. So he joined the Metropolitan Police Service in 1992, serving as an officer for more than 25 years until his early retirement on medical grounds in 2018. He was awarded the Baton of Honour as an outstanding recruit in his training school intake. And in the years that followed, he rose through the ranks to become a highly respected senior officer. His last operational posting was as the Borough Commander for Southwark and is an experienced hostage and crisis negotiator. Having served on both the national and international cadres, um, John is the author of Blue, a memoir, a Sunday Times bestseller that was published in May 2017. And his second book, Crossing the Line, was published in May 2020. And he was chosen as a BBC Radio 4 Book of the Week. He's sought after media commentator on matters relating to policing and society, regularly appearing on national radio and television and writing for a variety of national newspapers. You can find him on Twitter at Police Commander. John, welcome Thanks so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Now, I'm excited to have a chat with you today because you're 25 years in policing. That is a long stint. And just listening to some of the different things that you've been involved in, I'm pretty sure you've come across some, maybe some horrific and terrible things in relation to domestic abuse and, and male violence towards women. Um, but also, I'm sure you'll have so much wisdom to share with us as to things that we can spot and we can tackle. So, John, I'm going to hand straight over to you because I'm really intrigued to hear about your experiences. What can you share with us from your 25 years of policing? Gosh, well, the experience I'm happy to share, whether or not there's any wisdom in it, will be uh, for you and others to judge. But, um, yeah, happy to answer any question you want to ask. Uh, and any question that anyone else wants to ask as well. But yeah, I'm a, I'm a husband to one, I'm a dad to three, and for more than 25 years, it was my extraordinary privilege to serve as an officer in the Met. It was my duty and my joy. But I've often said to people that, that the painful privilege of policing is to venture repeatedly into life's hurting places, at the scenes of crimes and car crashes and cot deaths and every imaginable kind of catastrophe. It's, it, it, there's some research that's come to, to light very recently that says that most of us in the course of our lives will encounter extreme trauma on perhaps three or four occasions. Mm. Um, police officers and paramedics actually were the two groups that this research looked at during the course of their working lives, they will encounter extreme trauma on four to 600 occasions. Wow. That's three to four times in a normal life, four to 600 times in a policing life. Now, I, I mean, I didn't keep count and it's not a competition, um, but, but as a police officer, there are faces and there are places that you never forget. And so many of those names and places that I recall uh, were to do with violence mm. uh, and more often than not violence perpetrated by men yeah I mean it's almost 30 years ago certainly over 25 years ago that I attended my first murder scene in Brixton in South London only about half a mile from where I'm sitting now and uh, I won't go into any details for obvious reasons, other than to say that every single moment of it, I can remember as vividly as if it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, over the years, policing taught me a huge number of things. Um, but, but perhaps the most significant lesson of all in terms of crime and its impact in, on society, concerns domestic violence 
And I've said for a while now, uh, and I've written it in, in both books that you mentioned earlier uh, and said it on, on TV and in the press. I, for me, domestic violence, which of course uh, can be perpetrated against men as well as women. Uh, it's, domestic violence is no respecter of class or gender or religion or, or anything else. Uh, anyone can be a victim. But in my professional experience, more often than not, the victims are women and more often than not, the perpetrators are men. Uh, and I would go so far as to say that domestic violence is a disease of pandemic proportions. It is terrorism on an epic scale. It's the single greatest cause of harm in society. Um, over the last couple of decades in this country, on average, two women every single week are murdered by their current or former partner. In addition to that, three or more women every week take their own lives as a consequence of having suffered violence and other forms of abuse. And those numbers have actually gone up uh, in the period since the pandemic first hit last year, uh, one of the consequences of lockdown. Um, uh, and, you know, here I am now, um, three years into retirement from policing, but I, I don't feel any less passionate about the issues. Um, male violence, I think, is one of the most urgent issues facing us as a society. Yeah, so you mentioned male violence there. Um, I think that this is where we, we really get the rubber hitting the road because too often men can see domestic violence as a women's issue, but actually it really is a men's issue. And I think, you know, when we talk about the statistics the majority of the perpetrators being men, that it's the men that we need to be talking about, bringing into the conversation, discussing this with. Um, can you share with us, I mean, I'm keen for people who are watching on Facebook, obviously, to send your questions in. While you're watching this live, please do post questions. We'll have a couple of minutes at the end to, to ask those questions. But John, I'm really keen for you, um, because I, I really think it's important um, to share about the realities of this, the realities of male violence, um, not just within a domestic abuse setting, but just in general, because um, it is such a big issue. Do you have anything that you can share with us on, on your experiences of male violence as a whole and, and what you've seen to maybe be some of the driving factors behind it? Gosh, how long have we got? Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, it, it's one of the biggest questions that we could be asking ourselves um, at the moment as a society and particularly as men in society, because I agree with you 100%. Violence against women is a male problem. Um, and too often we find ourselves talking about the things that women should be doing in order to keep themselves safe. We question whether women should be out late at night. We question whether they should be out on their own. Um, we question whether they should drink a bit too much so they're a bit tipsy and tiddly. Uh, the fact that we're asking those questions frankly shames us as a society. The questions we should be asking are not whether it's safe for women to go out late at night, but what on earth are men going at doing, going out late at night and committing violence, committing sexual offences? We, we're for far too much of the time looking through the wrong end of the telescope. We're looking at it from a woman's perspective when we ought to be looking at it from a man's perspective. Come, go on, sorry, after you. No, I'm just gonna say, I just think that that's a really important point because you know we, we can too often have the discussion around the victim and not so much around the perpetrators and and so often when particularly when we talk about it that's why men are like oh well it's got nothing to do with me because it was a woman who was abused it was a woman who was assaulted or raped or murdered and the guy isn't even discussed very rarely discussed um and there's no challenge there for the guy to change what he's done um and so i think it's just a, a really really important point um, that we raise that so that men are aware that this isn't just isn't just a, f a female issue and you've just hit the nail on the head there looking through the telescope from from the different from the wrong end which is yeah really really important continue john sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you no no it's it's important stuff and you know gosh I've, I've got as much to learn as i've got to offer um so it's really important for all of us to be listening to other perspectives actually it's interesting here that we're two blokes talking about 
the issue. Uh, and, it, and it's so important that we hear women's voices. But as two blokes, what we need to be doing right here and now, but, but beyond here and now, is challenging our friends, challenging our contemporaries, challenging our peer groups, asking questions and demanding better of ourselves and of one another. You know, I've been alive for 51 years on this earth and for 25 and a half of those, almost exactly half of my life, I was a police officer. And there are two things that I can tell you definitively. There is only one cause of male violence and that is violent men. There is only one cause of rape and that is rapists. And anything else that we might try to introduced to the conversation or to the debate is a distraction from those fundamental facts. Um, before we start talking about victims, we need to start talking about ourselves, our behavior, our attitudes, our choices, the way we think, the way we speak, all of that nonsense about locker room talk, the things we say about women when women aren't, aren't present, never mind the things that we say to women when they are present the things that we do to women. We've got to start with ourselves. Um, at, and if anyone is sitting listening to this as a bloke, thinking it's not my problem, um, can I just politely, respectfully, but pretty forcefully tell you that you're wrong? It is your problem. It's all of our problems. And for as long as as a society, we're questioning whether or not it's safe for women to be out in certain parts of town after nine o'clock at night. For as long as we're asking that question, we're continuing to ask the wrong question. We're continuing to look through the wrong end of the telescope. In terms of the, the kind of the, the deeper, more searching um, answer to your question, what, what are the causes of violence? You know. Uh, Male violence is perpetrated by men, but, but, but how do they become violent in the first place? Mm. I mean, that's an incredibly important question to ask. And I don't think there are any simple or straightforward answers to it. It's, it's as complex as life itself. But I don't believe that any one of us is born bad. I don't believe that any one of us is born wicked, violent, evil, use whatever word or phrase that you want. I don't believe any of us begins life like that. So something must happen between the start of life and the point where violence is committed or sexual offences are committed. Um, uh, and this is where there, you know, there's, there's all sorts of um, fascinating research out there. For me, perhaps the biggest driver of violence is trauma. Um, so people who really know and understand this stuff will talk about uh, the technical term or phrase that they use is adverse childhood experiences, ACEs. So the things that children suffer um, in the earliest parts of their lives that have a traumatizing effect on them and to a greater or lesser extent impact upon their behavior as they grow up into adolescence and young adulthood. So I've already talked about how passionately I feel about domestic violence. So the other subject from my working life I, I feel most passionately about alongside DV is violence involving young men, yeah. life crime. Just this, this wave after wave after wave of stabbings in particular, um, but shootings and other forms of violence too. I mean, I have stood in far too many of the haunted places where young men have lost their lives. Uh, and I carry with me their names and their faces. Four young men in particular from four different parts of London at four different points in time where in one way or another, I was supposed to have been in charge. I carry with me the names of Ben and Dogen and Milad and Kojo. And when I've looked at the stories of violent young men, I've tried to look into their backgrounds, not just to observe and pass judgment on their behavior, but to try to understand, how, try to explain 
how it happened in the first place. And what you find in the, in the childhoods and the adolescences of so many of these young men is repeated exposure to trauma. And trauma can come in all sorts of different forms. Um, and people can look it up on the internet. There's, there's lots of good stuff on there about ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. But it can be uh, one or other parent who uh, is addicted to drugs or an alcoholic. Um, it can be the existence of mental ill health in the family. Um, it can be family breakdown or other forms of relationship breakup. Um, it can be the impact of having an older sibling in prison. Um, but time and time again, the factor that I kept coming back to was the existence of violence, domestic violence in the childhoods of these children. Um, one particular case, the, the murder of Kojo Yenga, was a 15 year old kid who was hunted down in the street in the middle of the afternoon in an otherwise completely peaceful neighborhood and stabbed to death uh, in one of the most senseless, meaningless, pointless crimes I've ever come across. And Kojo was a great lad. I mean, I never had the privilege of knowing him, but I'll never forget him. He'd never been in contact with the police, much less in trouble with the police. In fact, he was a role model for his peer group and he had dreams like all of us for the future, cut horribly short. And as the police responded, um, in the initial round of, of arrests that were made, there were, I think, it was 12 or maybe 13 young people who were arrested, all of them teenagers, um, some of them as young as 13. Um, and that group of 13 included the four or five who were eventually convicted in relation to the murder. But we took the group of 13 as a whole and we tried to explore their backgrounds from every available source. So we, we did some work with... with social services, we did some work with education, we did work with the local authority, and all we were trying to do was understand these children's life stories. And many of the factors that I described to you earlier on were present in so many of their lives. Um, a large proportion of them came from economically poor households and had been raised in higher crime neighborhoods. And we shouldn't forget or dismiss the impact of poverty in all of this. Um, some of them had previously been in trouble with police. Uh, a number of them had previously been excluded from education. Um, uh, some of them had older siblings who were in prison. Um, so that there were these factors that were recurring, but there was one factor that stood out uh, ahead of all of the others. Every single one of them, there wasn't an exception, had grown up in a home where domestic violence was a daily reality. And for some of these young kids, it starts before birth even. It starts when they're in their mum's tummy and the violence and the abuse and the trauma begins. And, you know, I, I, I have a very dear friend who is um, a twice convicted murderer who served 20 years for his crimes. Um, uh, his name's Erwin James and he's written an extraordinary book called Redeemable, if anyone wants to read it. And it's his life story. And in all the time that I've known him and in all that he's ever written, he's never once tried to excuse what he did. He accepts full responsibility for his actions. But so much of his journey, including in his time in prison, has been a journey towards trying to understand why he did what he did. And there's a brilliant phrase that he learned from a prison psychologist who taught him that understanding is not the same as excusing. Um, and his story is typical of the stories of so many of the young men that I've met or whose lives have kind of crossed my professional path. So many of them became violent in significant part because they grew up with violence. And so one of the most urgent challenges that we face as a society is breaking that cycle. And it starts with us men. Wow, there's so much there to unpack, like so many different things. And I think one of the things I'm really um, hearing there is, is, yeah, man, there's just so much that we need to be aware of. And, and I think with particularly with um, young men, like how do we, 
help break that cycle because these are things that we can see coming. You know, a lot of the time you can see it coming. I mean, fr from my own childhood, um, you know, my, my dad left when I was a kid. My mum was an alcoholic. Um, I, I got into fights all the time I'm at school. I was bullied. There was a whole bunch of different stuff going on for me. I went through trauma and I can, even I can see myself as a young, as a young lad, how easily it would have been for me to have veered off into a path that maybe wasn't so great. Um, and, and I see young guys now, particularly the people that I worked with through my work at CAP who are maybe unemployed or have been through stuff. And you can just see, man, like if they had the wrong person, invite them to something or the wrong incident happen, then we could have something quite serious on our hands. And, and for me, I just think, how do we even respond to that as, as men? as male Christian role models, even, how do we respond to that? Is it coming alongside them and showing them a different path? Is it stepping in at key moments in their life? And, and how do we empower ourselves to do that? How do we equip ourselves to do that? And, and, and John, you know, we talk about a lot of the time, the worst case scenario, and we talk about the murders and the rapes and, and the harassments and the assaults, and we can see, the journey and the path leading to that and we can see the different red flags if you will mm -hmm. that, that can that can take us there um what do we as everyday bystanders do john like how how do we how do we feel like we can we can make a difference in that situation when we see it brilliant questions and uh and there is actually an answer you know the, the picture i've painted so far is is a pretty bleak one but I think sometimes we have to place the darkness before we can find the light. We need to understand the reality. I think for a huge number of us, and I'm, I'm so sorry for your experience um, uh, and the experience that so many go through. Mine wasn't quite as dramatic as yours, but I'm not without my aces. Um, uh, but, but, but actually so many of us go through our lives relatively speaking, oblivious to the realities that so many of these children in particular are facing. Um, but the good news is that there is hope. Um, uh, and the good news is that there are absolute, definite, practical things that we can do that I guarantee will make a difference uh, in the lives of the young people we're describing. So one of my heroes um, is a Scotsman called John Carnican. Um, and uh, like me, he's a retired chief superintendent um, uh, and he served with the police up in Scotland. Scotland. Um, and he's one of the co-founders of the Glasgow Violence Reduction Unit, the VRU, which is an absolute beacon of hope in terms of violence reduction work. And if anybody's interested to, to look them up and dig into some of what they've been doing. I mean, it's just extraordinary, extraordinary stuff. And on John's watch and alongside him, um, a woman called Karen McCluskey and then a number of their colleagues, um, they, they took Glasgow from a place where it was recognized, um, I mean, it was described as the murder capital of Europe. Um, they took it to a place where, where violence fell off a cliff, um, reduced hugely and significantly. Now they'd be the first to say that Scotland is, is not without its problems still, domestic violence chief among them, but they made an enormous difference. And John has got a wonderful turn of phrase. I could listen to him talking forever. Uh, and one of the things that John loves to say is he says this, whatever the question, the answer is relationships. Whatever the question, the answer is relationships. See, the thing is that human beings are born connected. I mean, literally, umbilically connected to our mothers. That's how we're designed, it's how we're made, it's how we arrive in the world. We're meant to be connected and we're meant to stay connected. And John's contention and, and many others, and I'm in complete agreement with us, it, it, it's that when disconnection occurs, the problems arise. Um, uh, and without trying to be overly simplistic about it, what we need to do for and with these young men is reconnect them. Um, 
another of my heroes and great friends, uh, this guy called Patrick Regan, who uh, set up the charity XLP, um, working with um, teenagers, young people uh, right across London. And he's got a wonderful phrase. He talks about loving the hell out of people. Um, I, I often talk uh, about a young teenage boy called Billy Smith. Now, Billy's not a real person. He, he's, he's a sort of figment of my imagination. But, but he's, he's like a, a, a combination of all of the young men I ever met during the course of my working life. Um, and, you know, Billy is involved in violence. He's involved in all sorts of madness and his life is going entirely the wrong way. Um, Billy needs lots of things. He needs support with his mental health. He needs to be reintegrated back into mainstream education. Um, he needs all sorts of specific, practical, clinical, professional help. But what Billy needs more than anything else is to be loved. What Billy needs more than anything else is, is a consistent, positive, nurturing, adult involvement in his life. So for people listening in on this, thinking, is there anything I can do? The answer is yes. You can find someone like Billy and you can love the hell out of it. Now you can do that in all sorts of different ways. You, you can do it professionally uh, as a youth worker or someone who works in social services or in youth offending services. It can be a career choice or you can do it on a voluntary basis by volunteering to help out at the local youth club or at your church youth group or volunteering uh, with a mentoring organization and giving in a couple of hours of your time every week. Um, but, but the point is to find a way of reconnecting Billy with all that's good. Um, and for every story I could tell you with a, an unhappy ending, I could tell you one with a happy ending of the Billies of this world who've found a way back home. And so often it's as a consequence of the love of people who were previously strangers. I mean, I can certainly share that from my own experience. Um, you know, there was a guy called Dave Kendall, really good friend of mine. Um, he was a mentor figure for me. He came into my life at a dark time and, and his, his whole relationship with me and his ability to build that trust and relationship and then be able to challenge in a positive way, some of my behaviors and character flaws and unpick all of my past and history, my unforgiveness and bitterness. He, he was the guy that kind of showed me who I could be. He was, a, he was a great husband. He was a great father. He was a great godly man. And he was someone to emulate. He was someone to aspire to. And, and I, I can totally see when, as soon as you said it, I was like, yes, yes, I totally agree with that as a concept. And there are so many wise men good godly men out there who yeah if they were in the right place like you say maybe volunteering somewhere where there's some younger guys and they can see this stuff and they can just get involved and get stuck in that we could we could really see see some change um i'm keen to ask you this question as well john obviously with me not having a dad around as i grew up um i've recently been reading um governor b's book unspoken um just around uh, masking to ma um, toxic masculinity and, and fatherlessness um, and, and I, I wonder, John, you know, do you, do you think that we're looking for spiritual fathers, some of these young guys that we're looking for, for dads to come along and like you said, love us, love the hell out of us. Um, would you say that's kind of what we're looking for? Absolutely. And, and the reason that we're looking for it is because as I alluded to earlier, that's how we're designed and made. Mm. And my, my parents split up when I was 17, divorced when I was 18. But, but my dad, um, for probably his whole life, certainly his whole adult life, suffered with bipolar disorder, mm. which is an extremely challenging form of mental ill health. Um, so my experience is a little bit different to yours, but, but I, in many ways, lost my dad. Um, I, I lost him before he left physically because uh, I lost him to illness. Um, you know, in, in many ways, particularly in the early years of my life, he was extraordinary. But, but I, I, looking back now as a 51-year-old man, I, I can see I, I entered young adult life 
incomplete. Mm. Um, and that's, that's partly as a consequence of the space that was there that a, a dad could or should have filled. Um, mm. And so, you know, so many of us grow up fatherless, literally or metaphorically. Yeah. Uh, and so many of us spend the subsequent years of our lives, whether we're aware of it or not, um, looking for people to fulfill that role for us. Um, and that's not wrong. That's a good and a healthy thing. But, but, but equally, it's good and healthy to be aware of it. Yeah. So, so I, I, and I'm much more aware of it now um, the, than I was, you know, for example, in my early 20s. Mm. Um, but I, th I think it's, it's really important for all of us to have older figures in our lives um, who we can lean on from time to time, who we can look to for wisdom and guidance and advice. Um, mm. And I've been incredibly fortunate at all sorts of different points in my life, like you, to have found people I could rely on and who were there for me, who kept me connected. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a whole number of guys that I still go to even today um, for, for that kind of relationship and, and that, that strengthening of each other um, and, and that wisdom. And, you know, I'm intrigued as well because my experience of crime culture isn't, isn't very great here in Bradford. We don't. We have some, but not a lot. And I'm sure in London there, there is plenty of it. Um, when we talk about the father issue, would you agree that maybe it's the wrong kind of people that that our young men are looking up to and they, they get stuck into and do you think because because I, I just see a parallel here I guess between you know a young man going through a lot of rubbish in his life coming up and then going okay well there's this guy here who's in a in a gang who's involved in violence who's doing you know really terrible stuff involved in drugs and and, and I see this in Bradford sometimes with the young men and particularly around weed as, as a drug um, and then you've got like the good guys who who maybe are locked up in churches or are so busy getting on with life that as they've come up, they've gone, okay, well, I've got one option, which is a very bad option and no option at all. Or they haven't, you know, and, and, and you can just see how that fork in the road, man, can just, they just end up in the wrong path and, and, and they see the gang culture as well. This is where this guy is successful because he's got money. He's got authority. He's got, he's got fear. People fear him. I want to be like this guy. Um, would you agree that that is kind of, you know, a, a, another issue that we have, um, particularly, um, particularly with young men? The short answer is yes. Uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to oversimplify it. I, and I also think it's incredibly important to point out that there are tens of thousands of boys and young men out there, just like you, who grew up facing every kind of challenge, but turned out wonderfully. I mean, yeah. you know, we're surrounded in society by men who are, who are miracles. Um, I, I don't want this conversation from my perspective to end up being a downer on men. Um, I know that's not where you're coming from. No, no. Um, but, but absolutely, there is, there is real truth in what you're saying, that, that when you're growing up, you know, back to how we're designed and made, you're looking for connection. So you're looking to your elders to see what a man should be. Um, and in the absence of positive role models, particularly if your dad's gone, mm. if he was there in the first place, uh, and the neighborhood where you're growing up is high on crime and low on aspiration, it's a poor neighborhood, then so often the most obvious and immediate role models are the negative ones. Mm. Um, and of course that's, going to have an impact of course that's going to have an effect um uh and you know we haven't talked much about gangs and, and, and i think sometimes much of the conversation about gangs in the media is misleading and unhelpful but but relevant here just in the sense that so often where gangs exist people join them not in order to commit crime they join them in order to belong. Yeah. And they join them uh, additionally in order to be or to feel safe. Um, ironically, failing to appreciate that actually joining a gang makes you less safe, not more. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but that's what, 
and, and you know you, if you think about kind of really fundamental human needs i mean you know there's food and water and but actually belonging and safety are right there at the foundations of who we are um, and young men in particular who feel like they're unsafe and who feel like they don't belong are incredibly vulnerable to the negative influences in life and mm -hmm. and it's on all of us to find ways to respond to that yeah yeah i'm keen to answer some questions um from from the listeners watchers um live streamers um on facebook and one that's come in from um from anna and this is in relation to the adverse childhood experiences um so why do you think that they lead to higher levels of violence perpetrated by men compared with women because obviously women also go through adverse childhood experiences do you, do you have anything that you would uh, feed into that question well, well i mean it's a brilliant question from anna and funny enough i've not been asked that one before um and i fear it probably strays slightly beyond my areas of expertise mm. um you know i yeah anything i might say now is probably not much more than a poorly educated guess mm. I, I, I think there is something about the fundamental differences between men and women from the very outset um so so even if you remove adverse childhood experiences from the equation why is it generally speaking and it is a generalization but it's generally true why is it that generally speaking aces or not men tend to be more violent than women why why is it generally speaking that when you find football fans fighting it tends to be blokes when one generally speaking when a march or a demonstration in central london turns ugly generally speaking it's men fighting rather than women I, I, so there is something there whether it's in our dna whether it's whether it's nature or whether it's nurture or some combination of the two um i do think that violence tends to be um more of a male issue than a female issue mm. Um, that, I think that tendency is there more in men than it is in women. Uh, and of course, the, the presence or the existence of ACEs simply makes that worse. Mm. Um, I'm not confident that that's a good enough answer to Anna's question, but it, yeah. it might be the best, best I can manage today. I, I mean, um, we, we've talked, obviously, with your experience in the police of domestic abuse cases. Maybe, um, maybe a way to answer this potentially, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but say for instance, you come across a woman who has been violent towards a man um, in, in, in an abusive relationship. Um, I recently watched um, 24 Hours in Police Custody. Um, yeah. So I, I really enjoy that program. And that recently there wasn't a, a program on there of a woman who had been, yeah, systematically abusing a gentleman and put him in hospital quite close to potentially death. And, and it took a while for them to try and, um, get him to speak up but i think if you were to have a chat with the woman who'd done that you would probably definitely find the adverse childhood experiences i think that they're they're still there i i don't i don't think that it's i don't think that they're removed from the equation that, that the women who do perpetrate these kind of things probably still also have the same markers of the men but like you say maybe the culture is just so different and maybe their um potential for violence is 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 lessened but the markers are still there for those that do commit violence. I don't know if you have some experience from maybe some of the cases you've, you've looked at where it's been women. Is that yeah, still true? I, I mean, it's, it, it's a really important point to make because I'd hate anyone to come away from this call thinking that domestic violence in particular is only a case of male perpetrators and female victims. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I hope I made that point right at the start when I said, you know, it's no respecter of class or gender or religion or anything else. Um, and there may well be men on this call listening in now who are themselves victims. Mm. Um, and it's incredibly important that we don't diminish their experience, yeah. the reality or the severity or the impact of it. Absolutely, there are women out there capable of unspeakable violence. And there are men out there who are subject of it, victims of it. And of course, in same sex relationships as well. Um, so it's, I think it's really important just to acknowledge that simple fact. Um, 
I, I often find myself though talking more about male perpetrators and female victims just because the numbers tell us that's that's where the greatest issue, the greatest challenge, the greatest problem is. Mm. Um, and, uh, and if I reflect on my own professional experience, um, I could probably count on the fingers of half a hand the number of times I or any of my colleagues had immediate dealings with female perpetrators, mm. whereas I've lost count of the number of male perpetrators I've dealt with. Yeah, and but others got... will have different experience. But but yeah, just in this moment here and now, it's incredibly important to say that this can happen to men too. Yeah, and when it does. It's every bit as serious. Uh, there's another comment from Anna. Um, she says that she struggles to see how ACEs are an explanation when women experience them and don't become violent. Seems like more of a male correlation than an explanation. Um, which like, I think you, you mentioned in your, in your previous answer. Um, and, and Anna, I'm not trying to say that the women who do it is caused by the ACEs. I'm just wondering if there is just a marker there that, it, that often when we see it perpetrated, that there is something like that that may have happened. I'm not saying that it is an explanation. Um, but yeah. the, point, the point is we're all different and we're all unique. Mm. And you and I could sit down and discover we've had almost identical childhood experiences and almost identical adverse childhood experience exposure. You know, you could almost do a checklist for the two of us. And actually you've turned out incredibly well, whereas I've struggled a whole lot more or, or I've ended up serving a prison sentence for violence. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it, 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 it's, not a, it's not an absolute correlation. I'm, I'm not for one minute suggesting that every every child who every young boy who is exposed to violence in their childhood goes on to become violent themselves the reality is much more hopeful than that tens of thousands of young men and girls who are exposed to the most horrendous things in childhood don't go on to become violent themselves but but when you look at it the other way round, when you're faced with a 14 year old with a knife in his hand who is suspected of murder of gbh when you look at it backwards, in almost every case of a violent young man, you find that violence in their childhoods. Mm -hmm. um, so not every child who's exposed to ACEs grows up to become violent, but every child who becomes violent has ACEs in their childhood. Um, and of course, you know, for others, and it's not just about gender or class, or, or but, you know, not everybody who's exposed to these ACEs grows up to become violent, but they may grow up facing other challenges, whether that's yeah. mental ill health or uh, alcohol or substance addiction. You know, there, there are all sorts of ways in which the consequences can play out over the course of a lifetime. Yeah, yeah. But whatever the question, the answer is relationships. And, and uh, one from Jeanette, which I think is a, a really good question. Um, have you come across any effective church programs around abuse that can be taught? Gosh, I'd, I'd have to do a little bit of digging. Uh, off the top of my head, no, but, but that's not because they're not there. It's just because I'm not necessarily um, that well informed or educated about them. Mm. Um, but any effective program has to do two things. Um, it, it has to work with victims and with perpetrators. So it has to uh, address the reality and the lived experience of victims uh, and work in a way that ensures safeguards their physical, emotional, psychological safety. Yeah. But, but at the same time that we're doing that, we also need to be dealing with the perpetrator half of the equation. We need to be addressing the behaviour. Yeah. Um, and there's so many things that we have a tendency to do as men and indeed as wider society, that we need to stop doing. Yeah. Um, it's so important that when women speak up about their experiences, number one, we believe them. Um, number two, we don't try to dismiss them. Yeah. Or we don't even try to contextualise what happened to them. We, we need to treat with absolute seriousness the lived experience that they're describing to us 
And amongst our mates, we need to avoid doing anything that diminishes it or trivializes it or brushes it off to one side or says it's not for me. Mm. You know, as we said right at the start of the conversation, this is an issue for all of us. I think it's, I watched um, a really good TED talk recently. Um, it's, it's an old TED talk, at least five years, maybe longer. Um, and one of the things that the guy said in it, which really opened my mind to this was if you were sat around a table, he says poker table, but maybe any table, and you're with your male friends, and one of your male friends made a racist comment, you would have something to say about that. But whereas if he was to say that his wife belongs in the kitchen or that she's wearing a short skirt and maybe she might be up for it tonight, so many of us would just be like, oh, it's banter, or ha, 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 yeah. And this is what we're talking about here. This is where we need to eradicate that from our conversations because that is just as damaging and that is just as revealing of, mm. of, of a person's heart towards women a man's heart towards women because yeah these these are the kind of conversations we need to be having with each other s similar conversations to what we're having now but then we need to go away from these going well the next time my mate who always makes those jokes says something similar then i need to have to say something about it because i would if it was racist but why don't i when it's misogynistic why yeah. don't I when it's when it's I mean, the point is so, you know we we need to change what we do how we behave but before we do that we need to change how we speak mm. what we say but before even we do that we need to change how we think what our attitudes are and those three things are, are all part of a continuum how mm. we think how we speak how we act um, and we need to demand better of one another at every level yeah um at every single point along the way um yeah it's never just harmless banter no it's utterly toxic and destructive and it has no place in society you know coming coming back to to the subject of domestic violence when i wrote about it in the most recent book there's a whole chapter in there about domestic violence um, and at the end of the chapter, I, I describe some of the ways in which society's attitudes to things have changed over time. So I talk about the fact that, that in my childhood, which was in the 1970s, um, everyone smoked in pubs. None of us wore seatbelts when we sat in the car. Mm. Um, nobody ever talked about global warming because none of us had ever heard of it. And men battered women behind closed doors. 50 years on raising three teenage daughters of my own, they think anyone who smokes is an idiot. The first thing that we do when we get in the car is put our seatbelts on. Yeah. And we're all aware now of the climate emergency and every sensible one among us is trying to make changes to our lifestyle accordingly. All of those three things from my childhood have changed very significantly. Society's mm. attitudes have shifted. We've changed what we think, what we believe, we've changed what we say, and we've changed how we behave. But one of those things hasn't changed yet. And it's long past time. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's just, it's just so interesting, isn't it, that we, that we can see the societal changes and we can see the shifts and that a lot of it has come from education and a lot of it has come from public discussion. A lot of it has come from people making everybody else aware of the problems and the issues and trying to do something about it. And I think that's kind of what we're doing here with first man standing is we want to put it back on the agenda. We don't want the, the Sarah Everard murder to have just been a blip or a, a flash in the pan and for us to then let the conversation die down and disappear and move on. Because the move, the move of the news these days is so quick. Yeah. Um, we need to keep it on the table. We need to be having the discussions. Um, I think, just again, I'm coming back to some of the questions here. Um, and I, I, I think I'd like to maybe put this to you as well. This is from Susan. Um, she says that, do ace females commit violence on their children, maybe? Uh, I mean, there is some of that, um, mm. uh, undoubtedly. Um, as you probably gathered by now, my expertise, um, such as it is, such as I possess any 
um, is primarily around the male perpetrators of violence um, and the young men who are involved in violent crime. Um, and if I, if I talk less about female violence, it, it's for two reasons. One is I just have less experience and less expertise. Um, and the other is, as, as I've alluded to several times, is it is less regular, less frequent. Mm. And I'm just, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to offer too many opinions on, on subjects that I don't know quite so much about. Yeah, which, um, which is, yeah. I think it's just dangerous sometimes guessing mm. and stuff. Yeah. But yeah, absolutely. Um, I, if I haven't dealt with too many um, women who were violent to their partners, uh, I and my colleagues over the years have certainly dealt with women who are violent to their children. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I've, I've written about one or two of the most horrifying cases in my career. Um, again, in the most recent book, um, Victoria Columbia is a case that some people will remember. Mm -hmm. um, Baby P, Peter, yeah. uh, is another London-based case that just sickens me to my very core. And in both of those cases, there were men involved, but but absolutely there were women involved equally as perpetrators. Yeah. Um, yeah. And their story is almost too horrifying to tell. So it's there. It is part of the reality uh, on our streets and in our communities. Um, but time and time again, the thing that I came across most immediately and most repetitively was male violence and its consequences. Yeah. Um, just a question from Catherine, which I think is uh, another good one, and I can. I'm fascinated that, that and it's wonderful. But all of the questions so far have been from women. You know, I was thinking this: where are the men at? Come yeah. on, blokes! Come on, guys! If you're watching, please send us a question in. I'll um, happily talk to the women all evening, but, but, <laughs> but it's some of the men who need to hear some of this stuff. Yeah, totally. And and you know, this this is the whole point of first man standing is that we want to we want to be reaching the guys. And obviously, ladies, we want to be hearing from you. We want to be informed by you. We want to yeah, engage absolutely. you in the discussion, of course. Um, but we really want to be reaching men with this. So the men in your life, point them in our direction. Send them towards the series as we continue. Um, but please do keep sending in the questions as well. Um, so a question from Catherine: If a person finds it difficult to express themselves linguistically. Are they more likely to express them for themselves physically? Now, I can say that from from my own past um, and from my own understanding of myself and my own self development, that myself and some of my friends that I grew up with, um, because we were from poor council estates, we didn't have any um, positive role models. We didn't have any way of being taught how to manage our emotions and how to manage our frustrations that often that would end up in rowing it would end up in raised voices it would end up in punched walls it would end up in yeah fisticuffs with with people and and i can i can totally see that that is a thing definitely that if you are poor if you haven't been taught how to regulate yourself how to deal with conflict how to deal with frustration and stress um that you can end up, yeah, expressing that physically because that's all you know, um, and that's the only way you you can do it. I, I've seen I've seen that. Um, yeah, I give you I give you a really extreme example. So, Catherine's question is brilliant, uh, yeah. and to be honest, I'd want it answered by a psychologist, by a, mm. a psychiatrist. Um, I think I'm probably not the right person to answer it, um, but but I your experience absolutely rings true with me. But I have a, a very good friend. Uh, another of my heroes, um, Dr. Charlie Howard, who is a clinical psychologist. And for much of her working life, um, she's worked with young men out on the streets. Her clinic has been the bench on the edge of the estate. Um, and she told me a story about a young man who uh, she had worked with over the years, for whom the expression of violence was a source of comfort. It was a way in which he soothed himself, which just sounds like the most extraordinary, even outrageous thing to say. It, on first listen, it almost sounds implausible, unbelievable, until you begin to hear a little bit more of his story. And, and he is one of those who grew up in, from his earliest years with astonishing levels of violence in the home around him. 
Uh, I mean, just deeply dangerous, traumatizing, precarious existence. Um, but human beings are incredibly adaptable, um, particularly in our earliest, youngest years, whether it's the what people talk about, the plasticity of the brain or, or just our basic ability to adapt. You know, we find ways to survive. Uh, and one of the ways that we do that is, is that we normalize what happens around us in order for it to feel safe, mm. even when objectively speaking, it patently isn't, it's anything but safe. And this particular young man had become so acclimatized to violence that would make the rest of us weep. He had become so acclimatized to it that it actually became a source of comfort to him. I mean, how messed up is that? Mm -hmm. But, but he would have experiences where he would feel anxious to the point of distress. And the only thing that he knew to do to ease that sense of inner, inner distress was to go out and hurt someone. Mm. Now that's a really extreme example. It's one of the most yeah. extreme I've ever come across, but it, but it tells you something about the significance of what happens to us in early years and how that can play out um, as we grow up and later in life. I mean, I, I, as soon as you were saying that, I was thinking just about how many boxing clubs, how many um, karate schools, judo schools, do we see young men just going there to let off some steam, to get the frustration out of their system, to, you know, to punch a punch bag as hard and as fast as they can because it helps them express whatever it is, that the tension of the week or whatever experience that they've had at home or at school. Um and, you and those see... facilities are incredibly important. Oh, yeah. you're setting up your, your wrestling school. Um, and I've, I've done work with, with boxing clubs, with sports clubs, actually with music clubs as well, you know, but, uh, and they're, they're incredibly important um, as a source of focus for young people. They're incredibly important as a focus for physical exercise. Actually putting on a pair of gloves and hitting the pads or the bags can be incredibly cathartic. Yeah. And so much better to be doing it within the safety of a boxing club um, or a martial arts club than, than out on the streets. Yeah. Um, but in every case where I've seen those interventions work well, as important as the activity is, what's even more important is the relationship with the adults running it. Yeah, exactly. Back, back to John's quote, whatever the question, yeah. the answer is relationships. And, and you know this already, so I'm preaching to the choir. But, but for the young people who come to your wrestling club, the most important thing will be the relationship that they develop with you and whoever's working alongside you. Yeah, yeah, it's establishing that community and that safety and that belonging um, and exactly. showing them a different way and showing them a different way. Exactly. Fantastic. Yeah, no, that's, that, that is my whole thinking with it, is that I can do wrestling, come to me, I'll teach you how to wrestle, but at the same time, I'll show you how to change your life and turn it around and you do that in a safe way. Yeah, fantastic. Um, don't want to plug my own stuff too much, of course. No, um, we should be doing that. <laughs> um, great. So um, a question here from Pip, um, which which I can answer. Um, sorry to be jumping in, John, but uh, she's asked, is there anything like the Freedom Programme that we can run in churches? And I can say uh, yes, and I can say that we can say as Restored that we're working on that, we're developing something at the moment. So Keep your eyes peeled for that when, when it lands. I can't give you a date or a time, but we are working on it um, behind the scenes. And just to refer back to a previous question as well, um, just around uh, some programmes that we've seen work in churches. Later in the series, we will be speaking to somebody from an organisation named Press Red. Um, and that's a Christian organisation educating, equipping and empowering on issues of violence and abuse against women and girls. So those programs are out there. They do training uh, for facilitators, volunteer facilitators to run those courses in churches and in communities. So um, we will be talking with them uh, later on down the line. Um, and John, do you have anything? I'm just aware of the time. We've just hit eight o'clock. So John, do you have anything else you want to share with us um, as we maybe wrap up um, and finish up for this week? Well, I, I mean, the first is just to say thanks so much for having me on. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that we've been dealing with some tough stuff. Yeah. Um, and, you know, outside of this conversation, if anyone's struggling, um, 
whether with their own behaviour as a potential perpetrator or having been on the receiving end as a, as a victim, you know, the most important thing to do is to put up your hand and ask for help. Yeah. Um, you know, asking for help is not a sign of weakness. Actually, it's a sign of incredible strength. Yeah. So that's the first thing I'd say. We, we've dealt with some pretty heavy stuff, but but help is out there. But the second thing is really, uh, you know, to return something I, I, I said earlier in my Twitter bio, I describe myself as lots of things, but fundamentally I describe myself as a believer in hope. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't want to leave anyone in despair. Yeah. I'd want to leave people better informed, better educated, more aware, but I'd want to leave them with hope. I, I'd want to leave them with the stories of, of young men in particular who've turned their lives around. Um, and in every case where I've seen that happen, it's happened as a consequence of love. Whatever the, question, the answer is, relationships. I mean, that that's just, that's the tagline for this whole conversation, isn't it? Whatever the question, the answer is love. Thank you, John. You've been amazing tonight. It's been great to speak with you. Um, and I hope to maybe catch up with you again sometime. Uh, it's just been so good. Um, you have so much to offer um, as wisdom. You, you may put your hands up and say maybe not, but you'd really do. Um, it's been great speaking with you. Um, so thank you, John. Uh, bless you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, just to give you a heads up for next week, we have um, a guest called Emma Walters, who's a good friend of mine. Um, I've known her for many years. Um, she is phenomenal. She's got some great experiences to share with us. I don't want to spoil it too much, but tune in same time next week here on the Restored Facebook page for a live stream with myself and Emma Walters. We're bringing the ladies in to inform us, to encourage us, to equip us, to show us some of the things that we're getting wrong and to give us some, some teaching as well um, as we grow this thing. So guys, yeah, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your week and I'll see you next, when, uh, next Monday, 7pm here on the Restored page. Thank you.